Starting out landscape photography, in today's video, I'm sharing with you the five tips or five things that I wish I had known when I started landscape photography. I get asked a version of this question quite often. Hey, I'm a beginner and want to know how to take better landscape photos. But I want to say right up front, I don't think I'm better than anyone, far from it. Uh, I, I have so much more to learn, but the reason I started this channel in the first place is to share what I've learned in hopes that it would inspire and help improve your own landscape photography. So when I started landscape photography, I spent those first two years making the same mistakes taking the same photos again and again and again without any real progression. I was learning from YouTube, blogs, magazines, anything I could really get my hands on. But I didn't have that mentor figure that was saying to me, hey, you shouldn't do that. Here, do it this way. So instead, I had to figure all this stuff out. And so it wasn't until I figured out these five hard-fought lessons that I started to see progression in my landscape photography. That said, I definitely have a mastered all of these things. I still struggle with some of them. Number one, gear won't make you better. As a new landscape photographer, I was using a camera that I already had, a Nikon D3300 with a kit lens. And I would scour the internet for settings and gear that the pros were using to make their photos. And I would look at their photos and then look at mine and think, well, of course they have amazing photos. I would be able to make amazing photos too if I could use a Nikon D810 and the 1424 lens with a lead filter system and a fancy tripod and all these things. I spent way too much mental energy and time researching what gear I needed to take better photos instead of just focusing on maximizing what I had. Now, before going further, yes, your landscape photography will get sharper with better lenses, and maybe you can print bigger files with more megapixels. And sure, colors are better on full frame sensors, but these things are not stopping you from improving your landscape photography. These are technical things that, I mean, they might become important to you one day, simply aren't going to make your photos that much better. So instead of focusing on what gear I needed to make better photos, I should have been focusing on improving my compositions, practicing with my camera to understand how it works, and just getting out there and making a lot of photos, a really a lot of bad photos, honestly. Uh, another suggestion for those like me that are cruising on the internet looking for camera settings and gear is, in the answer I give to another common question that I get all the time, which is, you know, hey, nice photo, comma, what camera and lens do you use? The first thing I'll always give them is what they're looking for, the camera and the lens, but I'll suggest to them a more important use of time is instead of focusing on what camera and what lens is, focus on the last part of that, which is a nice photo. So instead of wondering what someone made a photo with, wonder instead how they made it. Consider the composition. What is the light doing? What do you like about it? What don't you like about it? What would you do differently? How would you approach the same scene? How did they approach the scene? These are all great questions to ask when you're starting out and looking at other people's photography. Number two, get comfortable with what you have. A bit of an extension on my last point, but another way of saying this is to turn your camera into a tool instead of a hindrance. Now, what do I mean by that? Uh, photography is an interesting blend of kind of a technical and creative side. And I believe that if we spend too much mental energy on figuring out the technical, we're gonna miss out on that creativity. I'm, not, I'm also not saying that we need to switch to auto mode and roll around in the, in the snow and make photos that way. What makes a good photo is one that is both creative and technically sound. So how do we get there? First, try to understand exposure. To save you from me rambling on for another 10 minutes talking about the relationship between shutter speed, aperture, and ISO, I'm just gonna refer you to Sean Tucker's amazing video on nailing exposure manual mode, likely one of the best and easiest to follow discussions um, on the exposure triangle and manual mode on YouTube. Uh, so I'll link that here. For this video though, I wanted to focus on what it takes to capture the right exposure for your scene. So when you're standing in front of a scene, after you've established your subject and you are starting to kind of dial in your settings, ask what is the most important consideration around exposure for what I want from this scene. If it's movement, then shutter speed is important. If it's depth of field, then your aperture is important. And if you're photographing low light, then ISO is important. For example, in this scene, 
I wanted to blur the movement of water, so shutter speed was my main exposure consideration. Shutter speed is how long the shutter is open for, and I needed my shutter speed to slow down or have the sensor exposed to light for a lot longer to give me 10 seconds of exposure that would give me the look I wanted. And this photo was the opposite. It was really windy out, and I needed to freeze the motion of the trees, so I had to ensure my shutter speed was fast enough to do so, around a 200th of a second. If depth of field is the main consideration, then focus on aperture first. Aperture is how much light the lens is allowing into your sensor. If, like in this photo, I wanted to separate my subject using shallow depth of field, I'll need a wider aperture or a smaller F number. In this photo, I use an F number of 2.8. If I'm taking a wide angle vista, then a lot of depth of field, so I'll use a higher F number. But to save myself from an issue called diffraction, I'm not gonna go past F16 and find that, like in this photo, I'm usually between f8 and f11, kind of the sweet spot for most lenses, and use focus stacking if I still find I'm not getting enough depth of field. ISO, I find, is really only a factor in low light situations. If this is the case, though, it's normal that I'm still only changing my ISO to a higher number if my main consideration is not being met. For example, if I take a night photograph, you might think ISO might be my main consideration, but shutter speed is still my main consideration even though it's low light. I don't want sky movement to ruin my photograph, so movement is my consideration. So once I set my shutter speed, I need to use my aperture and my ISO to get a correct night exposure. So the same goes for daytime photos. Once I set my main consideration, could be shutter speed or aperture, then the other two factors on the exposure triangle are gonna be going to need to be adjusted to maintain a good exposure. ISO is only really going to move off of its lowest setting if I absolutely need it in order to meet my needs for other movement or depth of field. Um, ISO, again, the trade out there is noise and, and, and kind of increasing your digital noise in your photograph is never a pretty thing. So if you can avoid increasing your ISO and play with the other settings in order to kind of meet your exposure needs, then I suggest doing that. You might be wondering by now, how do you know if you have the correct exposure? You can see your exposure by using your camera's built-in live view histogram, by bringing up your image preview histogram. In a histogram, you're looking for something that is as bright as you can make it without having any information moving to the far right side of your histogram. And that's where we start seeing blown highlights, and those are things that can be recoverable. So you're trying to maintain that histogram kind of near the center. Or you can use the light metering in your camera, try and move that dot to the brightest part of the scene, and then meter based on that point. So once we understand exposure, the second way we can strike a balance between a creative and a technically sound photograph is just practice. Get out with whatever camera and lens combination you have and work on understanding how to get a good exposure for every scene that you're at, thinking about the different considerations and what's more important in that time. Consider which part of the triangle is most important and then work backwards to try and nail your exposure. So once you've done this enough, exposure will become mechanical. You'll be able to do it without really thinking which will free up more mental energy in order to become more creative. And the same kind of thought process will go for composition. I've got a whole video where I talk about composition, so I'm gonna keep this short. It is important, but understanding a few basic approaches of composition and then practicing them in the field will make you better over time. You will begin to see different compositional opportunities without even thinking. And this is the main reason I will never recommend the rule of thirds or other compositional kind of laws and rules to anybody. If our mental energy is being used up by the technical side, whether those things are compositional rules that dare not be broken, nailing an exposure, setting a custom button on your camera, or thinking about the next piece of gear, we aren't going to be able to free up enough mental energy to take more creative photos. And I do suggest shooting in raw format. If you make a mistake in the field, you have far more forgiveness in post-processing with a raw file than a JPEG. Only switch to RAW though if you're editing your photographs in an editing software. A RAW file has to be edited. If you're shooting a JPEG, a JPEG will not have to be edited. Number three, create for yourself and what interests you first. So we've talked quite a bit about creative photos and I'll be the first to say that this is a difficult subject to really kind of breach. There is a huge discussion that could be made around creativity and landscape photography but I believe it starts with photographing for yourself and what interests you first. This sounds basic enough until you kind of really dig in. So to simplify a bit, I'm gonna tell you a story about my own photography journey. I mentioned in the beginning of this video that I was taking the same photos 
again and again and again. Now, to clarify, I wasn't taking the same photo from the same spot, in the same conditions. Um, I was taking photos with very similar characteristics to what was successful on Instagram at the time. My photos were taken with a super wide field of view and generally included a dramatic sky, so that could have been a sunset or a night sky. While I had fun taking these photos and they were a really great place to start, I found that as time went on, I went out more and more, I was becoming more drawn to those more intimate scenes. But I struggled really kind of initially with completely adopting that mindset. The main reason for that struggle was that I knew I wouldn't, they wouldn't be as popular or as mainstream. For quite some time, I ignored what really interested me and focused on what others would enjoy. And let me tell you, that is the fastest way to burn out and lose interest in landscape photography. It is also impossible to take creative photos when you are simply trying to copy what someone else has done. Creativity is made up of three main criteria. Novelty, something that's not been done before. Value, something that you or others find worthwhile. And surprise, something that's unexpected. So copying what is popular is not creative. I believe that creativity in landscape photography begins when we focus on bringing our own personality and our own uniqueness to a scene. So create what interests you, what is interesting to you. That could be super wide scenes with dramatic skies, or it could be intimate landscapes. Just as long as it's coming from a place where you are creating for yourself first, you will find landscape photography much more rewarding. And number four, get to know your local area. Quite often I hear landscape photographers that and say, instead of spending money on gear, spend money on photo trips. And I think the idea in the general heart of spending your money on experiences rather than things is sound enough. The general idea behind the statement, of course, is that you'll take better photos in more photogenic places. But here I fight back a little bit on this idea. While I acknowledge it is definitely easier to take better photographs in prettier places, I don't think that prettier places will always lead to better photographs. As someone who lives and makes landscape photographs in Saskatchewan, Canada, a flat prairie farmland known as The Gap, I will admit that I enjoy my trips to the Canadian Rockies. It's a lot of fun seeing those big mountains, but what has done the most for my photos has been the focus on landscape photography locally. Finding a few areas that are really close to home and exploring them until you really know them. It's easy to book a plane ticket or drive to the Canadian Rockies and take a photograph of Abraham Lake in the winter. But focusing on areas that have thousands of photos is not going to help us create more personal creative imagery. It's going to, it isn't going to train our eye to see things differently. And it's in our local areas under all kinds of light in different seasons that we train our eyes to see the landscape differently. And the bonus with local areas is that we can create locally is, I mean, what's normally very unique to you. No one else will see that scene. I'll still try to take as many trips as possible, but focusing on creating where you live, no matter what the landscape is, is only gonna aid you in seeing compositions, and most importantly, it can help us establish a personal style, so that when we take that trip to Canadian Rockies, we don't have to take the same photos that everyone else has. So I would just encourage you to get out as often as you can and explore your local areas and begin to look for those details and camera, camera in hand or not, really get to know a specific place so you begin to see what others can't see. Number five, understand how light works in your photograph. So while good composition is vital for a good photograph, understanding how light works or doesn't work in your scene is equally important. When I started landscape photography, my focus was sunrise and sunset of every day. I didn't care to understand how that light worked, I just knew that I would create a photograph during that time that would be successful on Instagram. While I certainly created a few photos that got some Instagram love and maybe they were really pretty, they weren't great landscape photos. While they maybe had a clear subject and good composition, they lacked a good use of that light. And I've already talked about the kinds of light in this video here, so I'm not going to go too far into it. But once we're able to understand light, we can start to become students of the light. And this is paying attention to a scene and watching how the light is interacting with it. Asking the questions, is it aiding in our composition or is it fighting against it? So finding great light isn't going to be easy all the time and it's going to require patience and planning. It might mean that we don't get that photograph today and we got to focus on something that is working with the light that we have. 
It could mean going back at a different day or a different time or a different year to get the light that works for the scene we want. When we begin to pay attention to the light in our scene and how that light can ultimately help our photographs in telling a story, we can improve our landscape photography and it will help us to find the freedom to express what we want to express with our photography. So those are the things I wish someone had told me when I started landscape photography. I hope there was one or two things in there that was were helpful for you and you pulled out of this. As always, leave a comment if you have any questions or kind of anything like that, and I'll try and get back to you as best I can. If you like this video, feel free to give me a thumbs up and hit that subscribe button if you would like, and make sure if you didn't like it, you hit that thumbs down at least twice. Appreciate you taking the time to watch this, folks. And until the next one, thank you for watching. Cheers.